In this video, I'm going to talk to you about a popular caching solution called Redis. Uh, in part two, I'm going to show you how to install it using Docker. And in part three, I'm going to show you how to interact with a Redis engine using the CLI and a Node.js client library. So in terms of the content of this video, we're going to be talking about what Redis is and how it came to be popular. And second, we're going to talk about Redis modules, uh, which are additional plugins that kind of hook into your Redis cluster and add additional functionality. And third, we're going to talk about some common use cases, why you may want to use Redis in your project. Uh, fourth, we're going to talk about pros and cons. There's some good things and some bad things, and we're going to cover both. And finally, I'm going to show you some syntax examples to give you an idea of what the language looks like. Um, so moving to the first item, which is what is Redis? Uh, so Redis gained popularity as a NoSQL caching solution. And more recently, it's kind of been used for multiple different things. Uh, it's kind of a jack of all trades, but many folks are finding great success in using it as a full-blown database. Uh, we're going to get into the pros and cons of that a little bit later. Um, second, it was founded in 2011, and shortly after it was founded, it really took a place in the open source community. In fact, the Redis engine is completely open source, and you can go take a look at their source code right now if you want to. It's all available for anyone to see. And third, it is a in-memory database, and this is kind of what makes it different, uh, and that unlike traditional NoSQL databases where your data is persisted to disk, Redis keeps its data almost entirely in memory, and this is the feature that allows it to reach some very, very fast speeds, uh, far, far quicker than any other NoSQL database. Next, uh, it's more than just key value. And uh, why is this so cool? Uh, so let's think about how traditional NoSQL databases work. They work off a very basic key value concept. You give me the key and a value, and I'll store it efficiently so I can retrieve it later. Now, in most engines, the value is stored as some kind of JSON object. But with Redis, the value can be a very complex data structure. And these data structures include things like lists, maps, sets, sorted sets. And the reason this is so cool and powerful is because Redis gives us a series of commands that allow us to do things like, get me the first and the last items of a list, or tell me or test if this element that I'm providing to you is in a set that is stored in Redis. So you're testing membership. Uh, so hopefully what's clear here is that with each of these different data structures that you're allowed to use, Redis provides you with some operations that you can perform on them as if you had access to them on disk. Uh, but the operations are instead being performed on the Redis cluster. So some very, very cool stuff that you can do with the built-in data structures that exist. And really, this is the hallmark of what makes Redis special. It's the support for these very complex data structures and the operations that you can perform on them. Uh, so next, we're going to talk about Redis modules. Uh, now, Redis modules allow you to add additional behavior to your default Reddit cluster. Now, in the out-of-the-box Reddit cluster, you get some very rich functionality for getting and setting values and lists and all that stuff. Uh, but you can add additional modules that give you more enhanced behavior. And this is open to the open source community. Anyone from the open source community can contribute to a module or supply a new module. Uh, there's also some very popular ones that are built by Redis Labs, uh, and some of those include Redis search, which is used for a full text search. So useful for things like um, autocomplete on uh, Google search. Second, there's Redis graph, which complements itself with kind of a social network style data structure. Uh, so for instance, if you want to ask questions like who are the friends of my friends, Redis graph will be a perfect solution for that. And fourth, there's Redis stream, which is great for capturing large volumes of data, perhaps performing some analysis or processing on it, and then spitting it out the other end. Uh, so those are three of the more common ones that I wanted to touch on. There's quite a bit more as well. You can go and check out their website uh, to see, I think there's about three dozen or so different ones that are available today. Now, in terms of use cases, there's quite a few different ones. Uh, and perhaps the most common use case is folks are just looking for a way to optimize their data retrieval. Uh, so say, for instance, you have an application and it's a little bit slow in terms of retrieving data from the database. Uh, you decide there's a subset of data that isn't going to change very often, so you're willing to cache it uh, so that you can look it up later. Um, those folks may choose to install Redis on their application that's serving traffic. And so they can use Redis as a kind of closer storage so that they can retrieve these values much quicker instead of having to go to the database. And of course, that's all stored in memory on those machines. Um, so optimization is definitely a very popular use case. 
Like I was saying before, um, many folks are trending towards using Redis as a full-blown database. Uh, and this is a, a totally reasonable and practical way to use Redis. However, there are some limitations that I'll get into a little bit later. Uh, third, you can use it for use cases like a leaderboard, maybe a video game score leaderboard, or maybe a chess ELO ranking board, something like that. Um, so the data structures in Redis allow you to quickly answer questions like who are the top 10 players of my, my game leaderboard? Uh, so that's another very common use case. You would accomplish that by using sorted sets in Redis. And fourth, you can use it as a message broker. And another word for message broker, another term is the term pub sub or publish subscribe. And the way message broker works or pub sub works is that you set up topics and you can register functions that are subscribed to that topic and execute some block of code whenever a message is published on the topic and delivered to the subscriber. And fourth, like I was mentioning before, you can use it as a data streaming engine to process and analyze large volumes of data. Using it to capture sentiment from the Twitter live stream is a very common use case. It can be used to compute word frequencies so you can kind of get an idea of what some common terms that your population is using. And finally, you can use it for its TTL functionality. TTL stands for time to live. And it's essentially a model such that you can put something in your Redis cluster and set an expiry date. And at that date, it'll automatically be removed from the cluster. It's great for evicting data that no longer becomes relevant. Uh, so next, in terms of the pros and cons, it's not all peaches using Redis. So let's talk about what's good and what's bad. Uh, in terms of the pros, it's super simple, very easy to use. Uh, the syntax is very, very intuitive, uh, so you can get started very quickly. Uh, second, it's super, super fast. So most of the queries that you're going to be running are going to be running in less than one millisecond. So you get fantastic performance out of anything that's stored on your cluster. Um, third, you have a very large community. Redis is arguably one of the most popular NoSQL databases or NoSQL solutions, I should say, as of right now. And there's a massive Stack Overflow community, tons of folks that are contributing to the module system. Uh, so really a stand-up group of folks that are gonna be able to help you out if you have any problems setting up or using Redis. And fourth, it supports transactions. For those of you that don't know what transactions are in a database context, I have a video on that. I'll put that down below for you to check it out. But what it essentially means is that you can group a bunch of commands into one action. And when you submit that action, all of those commands either succeed or fail. There's no partial failure or partial success scenario. This is very useful uh, for database applications. And if that doesn't make sense, go ahead and check out that video. I explained that very well. And lastly for pros, it's highly scalable. So you can add multiple different nodes in your cluster uh, to kind of make it more performant. Or if you have higher volume data requirements, you can separate that data out onto different nodes. So those are the pros. Um, there are some reasonable cons that I think you should know about if you're choosing to use Redis. Uh, and one of the most important ones is in terms of persistence or recovery of your data in the case of a failure. Now, the reason this is such a large problem with Redis is because, as I've mentioned before, everything is stored in memory. So all your data is in memory or at least a very, very large majority of it. Um, so what this means is that if you have some kind of power outage or some kind of event that kind of kills your machine that's hosting the cluster, that's it, right? All that data is going to be instantly lost. Uh, so thankfully, there's a couple different options that Redis gives you to deal with this, neither of which are perfect. The first option is periodic snapshotting, and the second is a rolling log that keeps a transaction log of all the events that are taking place on your cluster. Um, however, there are performance implications to using one or the other, and they can sometimes result in data loss. So if your application cannot afford some form of data loss in the case of a disaster scenario, then Redis may not be the solution for you. You may want to look at maybe more traditional uh, NoSQL databases or something like um, MongoDB or DynamoDB. Uh, unfortunately, for those of you from the SQL world, there are no relationships, so no kind of inner joins that you can do on your data. Fortunately for you, though, you can kind of work around this using a technique called embedding. Uh, what this essentially means is that you structure your data in such a way that you embed full data objects inside of other objects so that you never really need to perform any kind of relational lookup. And thirds for the cons, there's unfortunately no access controls. Um, and this is kind of one of the big problems with Redis. If you give someone access to your Redis cluster, they can essentially access all of the namespaces, which is the technique folks use to kind of separate Redis out into logical different tables. Um, so unfortunately, there's no access controls. It's kind of all or nothing. 
And the last one is that scaling can be a little bit tricky. Um, so you can set up your local uh, cluster, maybe with on-premise or on-site hardware, or maybe like a bunch of EC2 machines on AWS. Uh, however, it can be a bit of a pain to maintain. Alternatively, you can go with the uh, Redis Labs enterprise solution, but you are gonna be bound to their kind of payment model, and you're gonna be kind of locked into their infrastructure as well. Uh, so that can be a positive or a negative, depending on how you look at it. Um, so finally, in terms of syntax, we've talked a lot about what Redis does and why it's so great. Uh, so what does this thing really look like? So I'm going to show you some basic examples here in the next video. I'll show you how to get this all set up. Uh, so in terms of strings, so what are we doing in this example? So we're in the Redis CLI and we're using the set command to set my key to some value. We get a prompt back saying OK. And then we're getting that value back and we can see that some value gets returned to us. So it was set up here and you are retrieving it down here. That's just a basic set and get that you'd see in any NoSQL database. Uh, second, we have lists. And in this example, we have my list and we're pushing the letters A, B, and C. So there's now three elements in my list. Uh, we're doing an R pop from my list, which removes the furthest most element to the right, which is C in this example. And this is what we get back. And now only A and B is left. And if we do R pop again, B will be the rightmost since C no longer exists. So B is returned. And finally, when there's only one in the list uh, and you pop off of it, you just get the one element back. Uh, so that's what lists look like. And in terms of TTL, so here we're setting the key variable to some value, okay. Next, we're telling it to expire this key in five seconds. And we're trying to get that key right after we set the expiry. We see that we get that value back. And if we try to get that key after some period, maybe a few moments later, we can see that this value has been set to null. So hopefully you enjoyed this video. Stick around for part two now. We're going to get into how to install Redis using Docker and show you some commands on how to use it.